Hey guys, I'm Sitlali. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm with my mom and we'll be doing a story time. Basically, I almost died because of a mosquito bite. It's called West Nile virus. It's something you get from sick mosquito, but it doesn't make the mosquito sick. Only mammals and birds can get it. A couple days after the last day of school, I had like eight bites on each leg and one day my head felt heavy kind of like a headache and i thought it would just go away so i didn't tell my mom and then later it just wouldn't stop so i ended up telling her yeah she said hurt since the morning and it was already afternoon i said that's weird because she said it, her head felt heavy and she had never said that before but she was eating all her food all day and acting normal not acting sick at all told her to just let me know if it still hurt and eat her food drink more water rest right Mm -hmm. Premier was off out of town and I had to pick her up, but I kept feeling weird about Sweet Lolly. She woke up in the middle of the night, threw up at 4 a.m. You just oh, like I did. leaned over the bed and threw up. She still was like no fever and she said she felt fine after she threw up and I was like, this okay. And then I was supposed to be picking up Premier. I said, just wait for me to come because your sister's getting sick or something and I'm not sure what's going on. And then she all of a sudden had a, like a low grade fever. Like, I don't know what they say isn't even a fever if you go to the doctor or the hospital, like 99.5. They don't even count that as a fever. You have to be like over a hundred. So finally I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get Premier. But I was really nervous. So I was like, stay on the FaceTime with your sister. I was just like really worried. Like I felt really like a bad feeling, a weird thing to feel like such a bad feeling because her symptoms weren't that bad. It wasn't that strange. She kept saying, mommy, I'm fine. <laughs> How long after was it when I got the high fever? It was that night. I went and got your sister. We lost connection with you on the phone. I started freaking out in the car, calling you and you wouldn't answer the phone. And I was panicking. Something's really wrong because she's not answering her FaceTime. And Premier is like, mom, calm down. It's fine. I'm like, no, you don't know. She goes, everything's fine. I'm like, no, it's not. It's not fine. Something's really wrong. I got her on the phone because she just like, I guess I'd fallen asleep briefly. We were only a few minutes from home anyways. After that, a few hours later, that's when she started getting like super high fever. I don't usually like to give fever reducers, but I was giving her ibuprofen and Tylenol. I was having to put her in the bath because the fevers were so high. Going to 104.4. Like two minutes after I got out of the bath, they went shooting back up. So I kept telling her we're gonna have to go to the hospital and, the, and at least get an IV. She was shaking. She wasn't delirious and she was making sense and everything. It went up to even 105.5 at one point. It didn't stay there but a few minutes because I had her in the tub. But it's like we were literally living in the tub for hours. We couldn't get out of the tub. And finally I told her we're gonna go to the hospital and she really didn't want to go. Once we actually went and she told me that we had to go because it didn't go down. I don't remember much after that. We went to, uh, it's a children's ER. They're really quick. Basically got out of the tub. I threw some PJs on her. Only a five minute drive. Got her to the hospital. Waited maybe 15 minutes. And then they took her temperature. And it was 106.7. And I was looking at it. And I was like, that right? And then the nurses kind of looked at each other. And they looked scared. And then they took her temperature a second time. And it was 106.7. They started icing her down, but she always made sense. She never seemed out of it like you would with a high fever. I was really, really watching her nonstop because her oldest sister, Jasmine, had a shooting fever up once when she was like three years old, had a seizure. So I didn't want that to happen. I didn't really remember the children's ER at all. I knew we were going there, but I didn't remember it. Yeah, so she like losing a lot of functioning without anybody really realizing. First they said they were gonna send us home because they just figured it was a flu or something. The doctor felt uncomfortable sending us home because the fever was so high and the, you know They had iced her down so it was a little lower but They just didn't feel really safe like they were missing something They ran all these blood work and all these tests and they couldn't find anything wrong And she said I just want to check one more thing and she did this exam to see if she has meningitis She just said, you know, I'd feel a little more comfortable There's one more pediatrician up on the other floor if she comes down and gives a second opinion before I send you home I said, okay, then that doctor did another meningitis test with said that we need to do a spinal tap. The spinal tap, she has to be sedated for. I hate having my kids sedated. It's the most miserable thing in the world. So I was pretty upset, but we sedated her and they did the spinal tap and they checked the spinal fluid and they said that she had meningitis and we were checked in the hospital. She was 
mostly okay, but her thinking was declining. She wasn't able to communicate as good. And she was complaining of pain, really bad pain in her neck. And then her eyes started doing this really rapid eye movement and they move really quick and it's scary. <laughs> and I said something to the doctor and they said, okay, well, we want to do a CAT scan then. And so then they did a CAT scan. They got the results pretty quick and they came and said, I feel that there was a problem and that we needed to be immediately sent over to Children's Hospital in LA. Ivali is getting so bad. She can't be touched so much pain she's not making sense they say they're gonna bring the helicopter and then they tell me that I can't go with her in the helicopter and of course that didn't go over well I'm not sending my baby in the helicopter without mommy and they also said Premier couldn't come in the hospital and that didn't go well either because like at this point it was so serious like you knew that there was a risk that she was gonna die she was declining so fast <laughs> And it was scary. And, um, and I wanted her sister to see her and say bye to her. And they wouldn't let her in. I lost my mind. <laughs> and I was banging on the door and like, let her in. And then she came in and saw her sister. I yelled at everyone at the hospital. I don't know what's wrong. You only did the CAT scan because I saw her eye movement. You can't tell me that she won't die. So you're not keeping her sister away from her. And they all just looked at me. It didn't say anything because they all knew I was right. It wasn't them. It's the security guard doing his job. <laughs> Poor security guard. <laughs> but it is what it is. <laughs> you do different things than you might normally do when you think that your child might die. By the time we were in the helicopter, they had like strapped me down. It was a hard thing to strap her down because she was screaming and she wouldn't let them. And they finally agreed they were gonna let me go in the helicopter with her. And I when we got to LA, I saw the window and I saw the city. Yeah, cause we were up high. I was talking to her a little bit, even though it was very loud in there and I have headphones on and stuff, but I was telling her to brag that you got to bring mommy in the helicopter for the first time before your rich sister. <laughs> Or did I say famous sister? I don't know. I said something like that. I was just like telling her like- <laughs> I remember that too. I was like telling her like, you get to brag about this. Cause I was just trying to keep her spirits up. She still had medicines in her, even though her fever was up. She wasn't doing well. She wasn't even able to walk right anymore. Got there and we got into the biggest, I found out later, the biggest ICU room there. She was losing all of her brain function. Her ability to walk, her eyes were going so fast all the time now. It was just really scary. She'd be like, I need, I need, I need. And I'm like, what do you need? I already told you. All of a sudden her fever came down. So it's like she broke her fever. She would come back to the bed and she would go plop and fall back onto the bed. She was so exhausted from walking those couple of feet to the bathroom, even though we were helping her walk because she couldn't walk. Your grandma and grandpa, my parents were down there already. You brought your abuelita mm -hmm. because I was crying and I was scared. And I said, you know, mommy, daddy, don't leave me alone. I said they needed to do an MRI. She's in so much pain and I said, okay. Then they said it can be three hours long to do all of that, the spine, the neck, the head. Oh, because it's a, a long MRI, it needs to be sedated. I, as I said, I hate sedating my kids. I'm like, okay, I'm not like really thrilled with that. But then they don't tell me the other part, which they come back and tell me, oh, because we're sedating her and it's three hours, she needs to have a breathing tube in. And I'm just like, you know, sobbing. I mean, it's only gonna be four hours total and then the breathing tube comes right out and I'm like, it's not coming out. I could already feel it. I already knew it's not gonna come out and she's gonna be with this breathing tube in her. I don't have a choice because she's just declining and she might die right there. She couldn't see anymore. She went blind and she couldn't see. She was having phantom smells. She was yelling at us, telling us that we were farting. Um, her brain was completely inflamed. Nobody really knew what was going on. They dated her, I think her dad was there by then. After they sedated her, then something happened and all these people came running in the room, like 50. We were in the room and I started realizing we're in the way that something, it was an emergency. And the doctor said it was either inner, inner cranial pressure from her brain on her skull or it was seizures and they weren't sure which. They had hers strapped on this thing and they were giving her all these different meds, injecting all these things that I consider basically poisons into my daughter to try to stop whatever's happening to her. We all walked out into the outside of the room. It was scary. And they canceled the MRI right then, brought in a giant mobile emergency CAT scan machine and her because they were trying to make sure her brain isn't, you know, putting so much pressure onto the skull that she dies right that second, trying to quickly give, give different medicines. Nothing was really working. 
And then at some point they felt like she was stable, stable as you can be in the ICU. It's very rare to get West Nile virus from a mosquito, but it can be extreme when you get it and people get mosquito bites all the time. It affects your brain really bad. She had encephalitis meningitis that came from the West Nile. Because of all the seizures, then they gave the other diagnosis of fires, which means like that's one in a million rare. You have seizures that won't stop, medications won't stop them they were brought on by a fever in the beginning. They've done another spinal tap and they've taken blood and they've put a pick line in and a arterial line, an A line, all these different things. She's just hooked up to wires and tubes and it's pretty scary. They run all these tests and they still don't know all these tests. It takes days, like a week, some of them. It feels endless. It was so long and before they come back negative, 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 they couldn't find what was wrong. They didn't know what caused it. They didn't know why she was having all seizures came to her dad and I and they said that um, they would be needing to put her into a medically induced coma. I didn't even feel comfortable. I was giving updates to people, family and friends, and I didn't even feel comfortable saying the words coma or medically induced coma. I didn't tell Premier at that point. Her older sister Jasmine had taken over on updating everyone. She could use the word to tell people, but they weren't allowed to type it to me, say it to me verbally. You know, I don't want to hear it or see it or say it. That's why she gave the updates. And thank goodness, because it just got more and more stressful from there. The medications are like endless, page after page after page. They had her on so much stuff. Antibiotics, antifungals, antiviral, because they still don't know what caused what's wrong. She's just being pumped full of medications to an extreme level, to the point that even the doctors look scared. And she doesn't really remember any of this. When I was in my coma, I had dreams. I only remember two times hallucinating. Once I had a posy bed because moving around and like they were scared I was gonna fall out of the bed. And I saw like a spider, big spider on the net. And another time, Mir, I thought she was next to me sleeping, but she wasn't, not a real one, but there was a spider on my leg and I was trying to get her to wake up to help me to get it off and she wouldn't wake up because she wasn't there. They kept her in the coma for about three weeks. At that point, they had no way to stop her seizures. They had nothing they could do. The only thing left to do was to try the ketogenic diet which is developed for seizures. People use it for weight loss, but that's not what it was for originally. They had tried to just give her a keto formula. She didn't go into ketosis. So then they starvation mode, they cut the calories in half and they gave her half the amount and that did not put her in ketosis. So then they had to come to us and say, can we starve your child? Um, which means they basically only gave her water, MCT oil every four hours and nothing else. And still she wouldn't go into ketosis. When I told them, okay, so what's your plan? Because I, I cannot keep, my daughter in this state. I don't want her in a coma after three weeks. They're telling me she's either going to die, that's the prognosis, death or extreme severe brain damage. So they're assuming that if they take her out of this coma, these seizures are gonna be and then fry her brain. That's what they believe. I'm like, in the coma, she's going to die. She cannot stay in this state. I wanna take her out and take my chances. They had no, no other plan. They couldn't do anything else. So they took her out of the coma. And this is where she starts to remember some things. Not at first, she starts waking up in little bits. They said the first weekend she wouldn't move at all, but she was. She was waking up pretty fast. And then we get into the scary part. When they have kids that are on a breathing tube, they're all sedated. Imagine what you would feel like if you wake up and there's a tube in your mouth and you can't talk. Her body and her brain reacted in the fear. Even if she doesn't have the memory now, extreme agitation and fear of what you can imagine what it would be like to have a tube down your throat and a machine operating your lungs. So she was not doing well and her blood pressure started to raise. Her abuelita and I were telling the doctors it's too high, it's too high. And they were like, it's okay. So it got extremely high and they were just trying to give her all these different drugs that didn't work and just made her more agitated and raised her blood pressure and raised her heart rate more. Horrible respiratory therapist went and was like physically abusive with the breathing tube. That caused more fear in her, more agitation, the pressure getting up so high and so is her heart rate. And she went blind again from that. It's basically the occipital lobe of the brain is inflamed so much, but they say it's reversible. But she went blind staring through us. And when she first woke up, she wasn't staring through us. Her eyes would follow us. It was that she was blind. 
again a second time. At some point they had to take the breathing tube out. They were like not listening. What they were doing is they were saying that they needed the breathing tube in longer because she's not strong enough because she's been in a coma so long. I'm just like, no, like she's screaming all day long. She's moving. You can tell she's about to pull it out. She's trying to get control of her body, but it's been asleep for so long. So agitated that she's going to rip it out. Meeting with doctors outside the room all day long. They have to do this test where you breathe and they get a number. Each time I told her, I know you want the breathing tube out because she was so freaked out. And they tell you to breathe, you have to breathe. You have to breathe as hard as you can and show them you can breathe. Because I know you can breathe, but they don't believe me. <laughs> so, and she listened, she did it. And then they said, we're gonna take it out. We might have to put it right back in. So we just want you to be ready. Get all the medicine ready like it's an emergency. <laughs> because they're thinking they're gonna have to put it back in. And then they take it out. She just started breathing just beautifully. And then it was almost my birthday and she has memories of this. So basically night before the day of her birthday, like 12 o'clock at night, I started talking and the first thing I said was that I love her. On my birthday, yeah, she told me she loved me. In the bed with her and Premiere and Jasmine were there. Jasmine and her mom with uh, a vegan cake Vegan and gluten-free. Vegan and gluten-free. Yeah. We played the song Blow. It was like wiggling around in the bed trying to dance. Yeah, it was a great day because it was like she was finally like herself a little bit. Before that, when I say she wasn't herself, I mean like these scars on me are from her biting me and I had to hold her down like 24 hours a day and she bit me at least 20 times. The nurses, they would take forever to come and then they didn't know what to do. They just let her be biting me and I am just screaming and it was so painful. So this moment on my birthday is like a really big deal because we had went through weeks of that, not knowing why it was happening. The doctors were saying neuroagitation. Some were saying withdrawals. At some point in there, that's when we finally found out she had West Nile at some point. This is baby Shasta, so he became very important. He came from the gift shop. I went down there to get her a Squishmallow and I went with my mom. But they're such cute little animals too. And my mom's all, just pick out one and I'll buy that one. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, but we gotta get this one because it looks like Shasta, our dog Shasta. When she was like a rabid animal, I was trying to calm her down because like none of the medication would calm her down. I took Shasta, I was teaching her deep breaths to take away whatever horrible discomfort and pain she was in. I would say sweet things to her, I love you. Shasta's right here, kiss Shasta, mm -hmm. don't you love Shasta? And I would like put him in her face and it would calm her down a little. I actually didn't know he was a stuffy for a while. I thought he was a real dog. Our dog from home. Then on the 18th, right after a dose of medicine that she got at 6 p.m., which is called phenobarbital, 30 to 40 minutes right after that, she turned right back into a rabid animal. Right before my eyes, she was gone. And I'm like, oh my God, it's the medicine. When they told us death or brain damage, I told them that I didn't want to listen to that. And they said that they were ethically obligated to tell me. And I said, that's great. You told me, but we're not going to talk about that because that's not going to happen. See, Lolly proof. Mommy, right. For a few days, like I want to go to sleep. And I was thinking about like, the show I watched, The Legend of Korra and like a bunch of different things. She was hallucinating uh, quite a bit then. We had moved on to like the fifth floor. Yeah. I remember going there in my posy bed and they were like rolling me there. I think actually before that though, on the third floor, I had gotten deja vu because I was doing like physical therapy and I was like, wait, this already happened. We started bringing in the therapy while we were still in the ICU, trying to get her to sit up. All her muscles, they didn't know what to do anymore. Her brain didn't know how to tell her muscles what to do. She's having like extreme pain, mostly her feet her toes and her calves. See how sweet she is? She's always like this, She's almost. 99.5% of the time, she is the sweetest, most mature, most articulate girl in the world. And all that came back with her beautiful brain intact. I'm amazed, I'm so happy about that. She's so graceful, like watch how she moves and talks. She's so graceful, but don't take her posy bed. <laughs> a posy bed, kind of like a tent. I really liked it. A posy bed was actually a restriction for me. So. Restraint. It was very camping-like. I liked the posy bed too. I didn't understand why they really want to take the posy bed, but. They see it as a restraint. They thought at that point that she didn't need to be restrained anymore. She was really like wanting the posy bed because it made her feel safe. And I just really liked it. And Dr. Goldstein tried to take it. I got really upset and I went like full 
pet full mode. Uh, the doctor was like, I'm taking the bed and then... No, she tried talking to me about taking it. And then see, well, you know when she flips, you know And what did you do? <laughs> I just like almost like went out of the bed and like she's like I got you're weird. not taking the posy bed. So she's like, hey, sweeties. <laughs> yes. We're gonna um think about taking the posy bed. And then you're just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> On the fifth floor, this was the first lab I remembered. Like all the other labs before the fifth floor. I didn't remember. I was just panicking all over the place. You're not supposed to move when you get labs done. Like my older sister and my mom holding me. There were nurses. There was these child life specialists. There was this young girl. And then the girl just swoops in and pokes me. And I don't even feel it after a few seconds. So while I was actually moving, and nobody could hold her in one spot. This phlebotomist, she was so good. See, so Lolly didn't feel any pain and she got it like first try. And I don't know how she did it. I've never seen a phlebotomist do a moving target before. <laughs> <laughs> in rehab, we just wanted her to get like enough that we could leave the hospital. It was hard. They had required three hours a day, which means she had to do speech therapy, which was easy because mm -hmm. her brain was all back. Physical therapy and occupational therapy, which weren't easy for her. We'd have to get up at six in the morning to try to be ready by 9.30. It would take us that long for her and me to get her clean creams on her feet to get medicines or supplements in her get her breakfast in her and to get her moving where she wasn't screaming she would still scream if they made her walk because she was in pain quite a journey at the end of rehab i told her that she was gonna walk out of the hospital I wheelchaired her down to the front got out of the wheelchair and she walked to the car holding my hand then we went to the ronald mcdonald house that's where we were staying while she had all these follow-up appointments i liked being out of the hospital more and there were activities there. When we were at the Ronald McDonald house, I wasn't leaving Sweet Lolly's side. I was either cooking in the kitchen or right there with her. It was just like the hospital. I wasn't away from her. I was terrified to leave her. The workers, they were just not being nice to us. I mean, it was a really hard transition. It was great to be out of the hospital, but then I was having to figure out her special diet and cook it by myself. I had no support. They just didn't seem to care. It was a really hard transition and hard struggle. So Sweet Lolly would have these panics. It's PTSD. She doesn't want to be poked and we have to poke her. She's screaming. We would open the door. I'm like, okay, that way if they come up and then I'm like, gosh, nobody's even coming up. I feel like we should just tell them. Oh, you know, her dad or I would tell them. She doesn't want to be poked and she's scared. They would say, oh, we didn't hear it. It's okay. And we would talk to the families and they didn't hear it. But for us, it was like, she's screaming bloody murder. Then later on, they said families and guests complained about her screaming. Nobody complained. It was us who told them. After a while, they ended up taking us out of the wrong McDonald's house. And they said, we weren't fit for the communal living. <laughs> that we didn't fit in. But they're not really doing communal living. They, they don't talk to any of the parents. There's a parent that was there from Guam and he was so isolated and alone. He said nobody spoke to him except for Sweet Lolly's dad. So that's not really communal. You're supposed to help people and be kind, especially everyone there going through something, something bad with their kid. But basically that's the story. We left Ronald McDonald House. They gave us no notice and told us to get out and they did not care what happened. Now we've just been trying to adjust to life. Anyways, we love you. We wanted to tell you what happened to Sue Ollie. Bye. Bye.